I call my lecture here the Ephraim Awakening, Redeeming the Bride is the subtitle. Uh, this is part of the Yahua Triangle series, uh, which I have back there. Most of this is going to be coming from the content of the Yahua Triangle Part 3. It was a multi-part series, so most of it's coming from Part 3. Uh, first, I want to address the title, the Yahua Triangle, why the name Yahua. You've heard John say Yahweh. You've heard Doug say Yehovah. I landed on Yahuwah. Uh, I, I am not dogmatic about this at all. It, we are all doing the best we can with the with four consonants. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, your King James says Jehovah. Some say, no, it's not Jehovah because there's no J. So you end up with Yehovah or Yehovah, like Doug was saying, or Yehovah. Uh, some say Yahweh, that's one of the more popular pronunciations, uh, and I landed on Yahuwah, but I've actually gone through a phase in my life where I used all of them, <laughs> so, you know, why did I land on Yahuwah? It wasn't just because it was the last one <laughs> that I hadn't used, it was actually as a result of looking at a website called BehindTheName.com, and uh, it was my wife who got me thinking this way. She said, you ever notice the names of the prophets? And a lot of the prophets, various prophets have a name that includes the name of God in their name. For instance, you have like Yermiyahu, Jeremiah. Uh, yod heh vav -He has uplifted. Or Eliyahu, Elijah, my God is yod heh vav -He. Or Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, which is yod heh vav -He is salvation. So the fact that each of these guys who had the name of God incorporated into their name and it was pronounced Yahoo, that's what led me to, to use that pronunciation. Again, I am not dogmatic. I am not a sacred neighbor. I'm not like these guys that get crazy over this issue, but that's why I choose to pronounce it that way. How many of you are familiar with the Paleo-Hebrew rendition of his name? That's the earlier Hebrew uh, that predates the, the common uh, Hebrew that we see nowadays. This is sort of the pictographic language. Anybody know what the letters represent, what they mean, the meaning? Yes. Yod is the arm or the hand. Uh-huh. And the hey is a hey, behold. Uh-huh. And then the wa is a nail peg. Uh-huh. And then another hey. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, pay attention. Behold the hand, behold the nail, or, or hand, behold, nail, behold, however you want to, you know. Right into, I, mean, I have to learn that language. When I saw that, yeah. yeah. That is the coolest thing. And just like last night when I showed you the, the letter meanings of Yeshua, the hand that destroys the establishment of the all-seeing eye. <laughs> uh, you know, this, these are the things that got me excited. You know, when I realized, you know, I grew up, I was raised King James, King James only environment. Uh, you know, and it's the Lord. Well, that's not his name. And if you look at any website that shows the Hebrew from which the English came, you know, we, we see that the capitalized L-O-R-D was where they replaced the name of God over 6,000 times in your Bible. And where the Bible actually says, I want my name to be known, right? Over and over and over again, he says, I want my name to be known. My name is the Lord. No, it's not. <laughs> it just drives me crazy when I read some of those scriptures. So I started becoming more and more intentional uh, of actually just, even though my Bible says the Lord, just replacing that with what the original was, his actual name. Uh, and then when I saw the same thing, when I learned that the, the, the letters have meanings and stuff, and, and his name comes out to you know, basically behold the hand, behold the nail, it's like, wow. Care to guess which hand? Right. Right. Ah, how many times we read through the scriptures, my victorious right hand, over and over again, he's talking about his right hand. Well, here's something else that I saw really cool. Somebody took the more modern rendition of Hebrew and stylized Yeshua <laughs> using the letters isn't that awesome? Yod Shin Vav Ein. Yod Shin Vav Ein. <laughs> How cool is that? And I added this to the bottom of it. The hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. <laughs> but, yeah, I found that graphic online. There's, there's an artist, I forget the person's name, I, forgive me, but you can probably just Google it and uh, uh, Google hand in Yeshua or something, and you'll see this artist has a whole bunch of cool renditions like that. But God's amazing like that. The... Uh, the Yahuwah Triangle is, came as a result of looking at this scripture right here, Isaiah chapter 19, talking about the beginning part of this deals with uh, uh, part one of the Yahuwah Triangle series right here, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and why I believe that that's actually an a, uh, earthly representation of the New Jerusalem. I, I now believe, as Doug does, that the New Jerusalem is a pyramid structure. 
Uh, and for those questioning uh, John Gableson's logo for the Back to the Future conference, that's what the triangle is actually on there to represent. It's a talking piece. It's something to discuss. It's a clock. Some people are like, oh, is this an Illuminati code thing? And you're really a Freemason. You're a shell and blah, blah, blah. No. I made a video about it. Yeah, John's got a video on it. But uh, just to kind of back it up is that, yes, the dimensions given for the New Jerusalem fit a cube, certainly. But they also fit a pyramid. And in my teaching part one, I go through the top scriptures there talking about this monument and altar that's in the border and the center of Egypt and everything and why I believe the, the Giza, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza is actually an earthly representation of the heavenly New Jerusalem. Uh, there's a whole lot of, more to talk about that in part one, but just giving you a little background here. The triangle part came as a result not just because of the pyramid being a triangle, but at the end of chapter 19 of Isaiah, it says, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Has this happened yet? Are, are these guys all happy together? <laughs> is there a highway connecting these guys and everybody's playing nice? No. no. So clearly this is a prophetic scripture. It has not happened yet. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Well, you've got three locations right there, and if you just kind of put little pins in each of those locations and connect the dots, you end up with the triangle, right? So that's what the Yahuwah triangle is, and I go into a lot more detail on all that in part two. And I'll talk a little bit about the significance of the land we now call Israel. And that came as a result of myself doing a study on the Garden of Eden. I was like, okay, where was the Garden of Eden? And I, there was another guy, I think it was Stan Deo, that did a whole thing around the same time I was doing this research. And he came up with the Garden of Eden is in Tanzania. And I'm like, Dude, I mean, what? I, I mean, I mean, he gives a compelling. I've seen his presentation, and it, you know, it's interesting. But I'm like, to what? Uh, especially with regard to the, the the Gihon. It says the Gihon encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia, and you know, he had the Gihon going like around India or someplace. I'm like, dude. Uh, but I was doing my research about the same time he published his stuff, and uh, it, when I first heard the guy, I, I otherwise respect his work. I like his work. Uh, and when I heard that he, was, he had put stuff out saying, you know, he had found the Garden of Eden, I was like, oh, cool, because I, I was in the middle of my research. And then I watched him like, no, nah, that's, not, that's not the direction I went. You know, you know God bless him, I, you know, I, whatever. So anyway, when you, whenever you, and somebody starts to try to figure out where the Garden of Eden is, they will always look, you know, the scripture right here tells us in Genesis 2, the four rivers, right? That's a great place to start when you try to figure out where the Garden of Eden is is figure out where the rivers are. Well, we know two of them are still in existence today, right? The Euphrates and the Tigris, uh, which used to be uh, the uh, Hittakel, I believe. Um, the Gihon is the interesting one to me. That was the, the real clincher. Uh, the the Pison actually goes to the land of, uh, uh, it says, the name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasses the whole land of Havala, where there is gold. First thing I want you to notice there, it's written in present tense, the time when Moses wrote this. Okay, So they knew when he was, when he was given these locations, it was at a time and described in a way that people would go, oh, okay, yeah, we know where that is. Because you know? some people say, well, there was the flood, right? And that messed up the topography. And that's part of the big part of uh, uh, Stan's research was, you know, the earth, whole earth looked completely different. And so the rivers are all different, you know, before the flood than after the flood. Well, I would point to this and say, well, this is in present tense. Yeah. You know, there's gold there. You know, the gold's good. And everybody go, oh, yeah, we don't, yeah, that's cool. And uh, the Gihon, the same as it, that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia, present tense. Oh, okay, we know that. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about the other two rivers is if you go on Google Earth, you can see the peace on it's, it's a dried riverbed. It's no longer a river today, but you can see where there once was a river. And it goes right where you see the, the um, Euphrates and the Tigris come down into the Gulf right there on Kuwait. Well, if you just kind of go off right to the left of where the Euphrates comes into the Gulf right there, you'll, on Google Earth and zoom in right there, you'll see a dry riverbed that goes all the way across Saudi Arabia that I believe was, is the remains of the, the peace on. Okay. So Gihon, it says it encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Well, I actually believe that the, the Gihon, we know the Gihon Springs are still in existence today, but they're underground. They're not above ground. So they may have been submerged as a result of the flood, but they are clear, it's clearly still in existence. Quite a few places in Scripture reference the Gihon, but it's underneath the land of Israel. It was also specifically underneath the temple. Well, guess what? 
the, the, the ancient text and the biblical text let you know that it was underneath the temple. Yeah. Well, the thing we call the Temple Mount right now, the Gihon does not go underneath that thing. It kind of goes around it and goes over the city of David, which means the Temple Mount is not the Temple Mount. So frankly, I don't care what they do on that thing because it has no, it's Rome. It's a fortress Antonia. Uh, so any temple that shows up there is a counterfeit, in, in, in my opinion. The temples that Jerusalem forgot. This is a bird's eye view from the east of the temple square itself. You can see it's exactly a square. This is a view from the southeast. Notice on the northwest corner two columns reaching northward to Fort Antonia. The exact southeast corner was known as the pinnacle where Satan took Jesus in the vision that he had mentioned in the New Testament. Here we see the whole of Fort Antonia from the southwest angle. Notice how much larger it is than the temple itself. You see Robinson's Arch coming out near the southwest angle there. Where does the evidence lead? And as I'm studying the Bible, Chuck, as you know that, you've gone through the verses as well, these verses that seem to be clouded in ambiguity become startlingly clear when you place the temple in the city of David mm -hmm. and off the Temple Mount. And then history follows and, and, and sort of falls in a square peg in a square hole. Bob and I go back a bit, yeah, been and partner, I'm, just, partner. I'm, I'm flattered to be at his elbow as he, ch he takes on these things. But yeah. boy, he, he he really picked a dandy this time right. to go to go into the temple uh, issue. Is uh, <laughs> that's a gutsy move. I started in on this temple, and then I found day and night I was researching and writing and traveling, and uh, sort of consuming of my time. And I believe that the greatest archaeological blunder of all time has occurred and that the temple is not on the Temple Mount, which causes people to be very upset, I know. Traditionalists will be very angry at me, but I've got to relay the evidence as the evidence presents itself. But you're not alone in this, though, are you? That's, that's the, been the startling uh, fact that's come out, is uh, not only do you have uh, uh, the, uh, um, the information that you read from Ernst, but also other people that have come alongside and begin to validate. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I've had I've had a cadre of scholars, you know, Frank Kirks and Dan Haydens and Chuck seems to be favorable to this thing. I have a I've been looking at my internet every day on my emails, waiting for the scholars to just rake me over the coals. And I expected maybe ten a day to come in. Since I wrote the book, I haven't had one negative email from anybody on this book, which is surprising to me because uh, a lot of people don't want to challenge it. I took it to I took this book to uh, a, a university, I won't say what it was, big university in California, and three of the archaeological heads of the department were there. Two of them said, this book is fantastic. Uh, the, this, I, I, I'm with you 100% on, on, on your thesis. Uh, the other one said, I don't agree with you at all. And he was the head of the department. I said, I took out my book. I said, well, show me where I'm wrong. He says, oh, he goes, I haven't read your book. He said, just on the premise, it's wrong. <laughs> there you go. Weeks, don't don't confuse later, me. I got a three-page letter from him saying that I was right on in this uh, assumption. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And That's there have a... been others. I, I won't mention the name because I don't want to speak for them, but uh, I'm, I'm on, the, on the board with some uh, very, very prominent uh, 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 Authorities. Yes. And I'm quite yes. surprised that they have they've endorsed them also. And I won't say it because I don't have written yeah. evidence of it. But yeah. but the net of it is is that uh, uh, what's interesting to me. Not only is he confirmed by the Word of God, and that's the critical one, but also uh, I have been so schooled by Tuvia Sagiv in the Roman practice for forts, the 35 acre plan that they always use, and it fits all that. In other yes. words, if you come at it from the Antonia Fortress. If you put together everything we think we know mm -hmm. about Roman practices in the uh, uh, in the first century and before, uh, it also fits that the, what we call the Temple Mount is clearly not the Temple Mount, and that's where that's where Titus had his office mm -hmm. and during the during the fall of Jerusalem in 780. Mm -hmm. So all those pieces, and suddenly Josephus, everybody sort of takes Josephus with a tongue in the cheek. No, Josephus turns out to be precise and correct. 
and when you try to reconcile what he tells you, all you have to do is listen to what he says, and it all fits so, so well. So that's the other thing that in, our, in the Institute, that because of all of this, I'm, I'm arguing that within the Koine Institute, that we have a course on Josephus, that we really study Josephus as a target, right. because he was an eyewitness at the time, and there's so much to learn mm. if we just take the time yes. to go through his stuff. Uh, and that was just a side piece, you know, I, I was, when I was locked in on each of these four rivers trying to figure them out, and I just really got into a deep study on the Gihon, and King Solomon was anointed king, and it said they went down to the Gihon, and he came back up, so they went underground, and you can go there on a tour today and go to where, you know, supposedly they think that he was, he was lowered down and to do the, the anointing and whatnot. Um, but it was underground. And so, I, and I'm looking at it, and then you see Josephus and all these other people talking about that it was under the temple. And I'm going, well, it, it, you know, it's not under the Temple Mount. So then, you know, my, my, I'm just looking for the Garden of Eden, you know, like, what? The Temple Mount's not the Temple Mount? And, you know, I'm kind of freaking out a bunch of, b bunch of stuff like that. I think that originally the Gihon was obviously above ground, I believe, uh, and then it came down and connected with the Nile. And the Nile comes down, and, and it, it, the Nile stops before you get to Ethiopia today. But if you just look at the topography of that area, if it was a bigger, more powerful river, you could see how it could have found routes through lowland areas and went down and probably wrapped around Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa right there. Uh, and if that's true, and that's speculation, I admit it, uh, then it's rather interesting with Moses going into, you know, being pulled from the Nile and you know, all that kind of stuff. It makes some of the stories that we know about the Nile a little bit more interesting, in, in my opinion. Uh, so... I'm going, okay, so the Gihon's what throws everything out of whack because other than Stan thinking it's in Tanzania, a lot of other researchers place the Garden of Eden over in uh, uh, like where the Euphrates and the Tigris come down, right there in the, in the Gulf, like in Kuwait area. A lot of researchers point there because you got the two and you got the peace on, so you got you know, three of the four all coming together in that one area. So it makes sense that you'd say, well, that must have been where the Garden of Eden was. Uh, but the Gihon throws the whole thing out of whack because that's way over west, you know, uh, and so I'm going, wait a minute, you, you, you've got this triangle-like shape with the rivers, you've got the Euphrates and the Tigris and the peace on and then the Gihon over here, so I'm going, I've got another triangle here, and I found the key to figuring out where the Garden of Eden was, was actually just to follow Abraham, follow Abraham back, and uh, so that came as a result of building this chart right here, I have a, a large version of this timeline chart, I'm a visual person, so I, whenever I start figuring stuff out, I gotta put it in some sort of visual format so I can wrap my mind around it. And so I created this timeline right here that describes, uh, you know, just coming right off, off the ark, uh, Shem, Hem, and, uh, and, you know, his, Shem's, I mean, Noah's sons, and Nimrod, and Abraham being born, and how Abraham's life paralleled Nimrod's life. I mean, it's just ex ex extraordinary what's going on between those two characters. So that's what this timeline chart represents, is the life of Nimrod and the life of Abraham. Uh, now, I started to ask, you know, why Abraham? What was so special? Why did God choose him in the first place? Well, we, knew, we know that he lived in the land of Shinar and uh, uh, that Nimrod was uh, made king of the world in 1948. Interesting. Now, this is 1948 AM, in other words, year since creation. So Nimrod was in the land of Shinar and he had been made king of the world in 1948. This was the same year that Abram was born. So a lot of people say, well, that's why Israel was formed as a nation in 1948, because that's the year that Abram was born. Uh, the problem is everything about that thing over there that we call Israel, it has nothing to do with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everything's jacked up. I mean, they got the Star of Renfam on the flag right there. I know some people want to defend that, but if you study that out, that's what Stephen's warning against in, in Acts chapter 7. Um, and so I started, I'm like, wait a minute. And I already started questioning the Temple Mount deal and realizing that's really Rome. And I've been there. I, 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 I have made, a, made out a prayer and put it in the wall and did the whole you know, deal. I, you know, I played that game like everybody else did when I believed it. But then when I started doing the research and finding out, oh, well, that's actually Rome and everybody's bowing to Rome. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is just really jacked up. And then I start looking at, you know, is this really the nation of Israel that we're all waiting for? We know that there's a promise in gathering of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And so people will say, well, yeah, Isaiah, you know, can a nation be born in a day? Yep. 1948, you know, May, was it May 14th, 1948? They'll point to Isaiah 66, 8, right? Can a nation be born in a day? 
Well, if you keep reading, first of all, if you understand the context of 66, it's in the context of chapter 65, which is in a millennial reign context. And four verses later, after verse 8, it says, peace will flow from that Israel like a river. Question, have we had peace flowing like a river from that place? No, so then they'll point to the two sticks coming together in Ezekiel 37, right? It's the dry bones are coming together. They're just waiting for the Spirit of God to come into them. Okay, go read Ezekiel 37, line by line, and ask yourself, did this happen? And what you're going to find is, did this happen? No. Did this happen? No. Did this happen? You're going to, and then you're going to be like, why? why is everybody saying it did then? And then you're going to start going, well, wait a minute. Am I believing in some kind of big lie here? Because, you know, in the prophetic circles, that, in, in, in the sense I mean prophecy conferences that, that I've run in, you know, going to all these prophecy conferences, Everybody's got their time clock starting in 1948. And this, well, this nation will not pass away until all these things come in. They start the clock in 1948. And in 1988, I, you may remember this, some of you, there was 88 reasons why Christ is going to return in 1988 because it was 40 years from 48. That was a year after I got out of high school. I was in the Army. I was one of those guys. Oh, yeah, yeah this is it. You know, Israel's 48. Right? Of course, that came and went. So then anybody said, well, maybe generation is not 40 years. So Psalm 90, verse 10 says it's 70 years. So now you get ready. Everybody's going to be talking between now and, what, uh, 2018? So expect it. And then when that doesn't happen, they're going to say, well, it says 80 if by strength. So we're going to push it another 10 years. Uh, I'm just going to suggest right off the bat that your clock is all wrong to begin with. If you just read the Bible, instead of listening to people... You won't fall into deception. The title of this conference is Decoding Deception. Well, you know, I'm helping you out here. Stop listening to well-meaning pastors and open your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. I don't even want you to let me be your teacher. 1 John chapter 2 says you have no need of a teacher. The Holy Spirit's going to be your teacher. So just open the scriptures for yourself and read it. And all of the usual scriptures people use to try to justify that don't fit. Not one of them do. So I'm like, well, I mean, it, clearly we see that in the last days there are things taking place in the land of Israel and that there are people of the Israeli tribes that are there in the last days context. But if the nation is not going to be established until the end of the tribulation in, in the millennial reign, then what scriptures do fit this thing that's over there? I'm just going to suggest to you that there are, are better fits than the ones that we usually point to. These are the ones we usually point to. Isaiah 66, 8, but I point, you know, four verses later, verse 12, peace like a river, eh, that's not working. I, I think this is the better one. Zephaniah chapter 2 talks about gather yourselves together, nation undesired, right? And it says the fierce anger of the Lord's coming upon them. He said, okay, yeah, go ahead and gather yourselves together. There's two ingatherings. There's one in belief, the, the one that we're all waiting for, that Messiah himself is going to do. In fact, one of the things that confirmed my thoughts on this is when I saw Orthodox Jewish rabbis protesting this and saying, that's a violation of our Torah. I'm going, wait a minute, okay, you can say whatever you want about me, stupid, ignorant, Gentile guy, whatever. You know, I'm not a Gentile anymore because I've crossed over and I'm Hebrew now. Grafted in Romans 11 and all that. But they would still view me as a goyim. Uh... But here are Orthodox Jewish rabbis that get together by the tens of thousands sometimes in these huge protests saying, you know, that's what's going on over there that we don't support. It. Political Zionism. Right? So I'm going, oh, well, okay. I mean, that appears to be what's going on here is a group that's gathered themselves together in unbelief. I mean, is it, would you say that by, as a country? Is it a Torah-keeping country? There, are, there, are, there is a remnant there of people and I do believe there are genuine blood Jewish people there. But I also believe there are some who are calling themselves Jews that are not really Jews. Uh, and I think there are also blood related from other tribes that are there as well. I believe that there are genuine, real Israelite people there. I would say the same thing Yeshua said, get out of there unless God told you to be there. You know, some people are called to be there to be ministers and to witness to the brothers. I get it. I'm all for that. But my advice would be, unless the Holy Spirit specifically told you to go there, I would not be going there. I wasn't going to wait for Messiah to take you there. Because that place is headed for Zechariah chapter 13, where it says two-thirds is going to die and one-third's going through the fire. That's the place Yeshua said in the last days, if you're there, get out. So these are the things I'm going, well, you know, here you got all these scriptures talking about two-thirds of that place is going to die, one-third is going through the fire, and Yeshua is saying, if you're there, get out. So how can that possibly be the place we're all waiting for to eagerly see the end? It's not. 
In, in my mind, it's absolutely a counterfeit. If this is all new to you, this is a great book I recommend by Todd D. Bennett. It's called The Redeemed. This is a quote in his book. He said, The United Nations, that ungodly organization, has no authority to establish any part of Yahuwah's kingdom. I agree 100%. Amen. And when you realize that World War I, World War II, and World War III were all scripted, there, there was a script written in the 1800s. Now, some people assign it to Albert Pike. I tend to believe that. Others say, no, it wasn't him. I don't care who wrote it. It was written prior to World War I, and World War I followed the script perfectly. World War II followed the script perfectly. All was designed to create this thing, and World War III is following the script today. Perfectly. So I'm going to follow a script, but my script's going to be the Holy Spirit-inspired script of, of Scripture, <laughs> and I'm not going to support that. People are like, we got to support Israel. Okay, great. What, how are we defining Israel? Because <laughs> uh, I'm all about supporting Israel. But I'm not going to support political Zionism. Just same reason why I don't pledge allegiance to the flag of my country anymore either. I have a different kingdom. And I'm waiting for my Messiah, just like the Orthodox Jewish rabbis are waiting for the Messiah. Because they understand, if you read Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah 31, the entire book of Hosea, the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, and Isaiah 65 and 66... You see, God says over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, I'm going to do this. Me. Amen. Well, God can use pagans to accomplish as well. Look what he did with Cyrus, King Cyrus. Yeah, he told through the prophets that he was going to even name the guy. Right. Isaiah 3, 7. Was it? I think it's 3, 7. No, Amos 3, 7. Amos 3, 7. He says, I don't do anything except I tell the prophets first what I'm going to do. So if God intends to use pagans to accomplish his will, he tells you when he's going to do that. But when he says over and over and over again, especially through the book of Jeremiah, he says that it's going to be what we now call a greater exodus. It's going to happen in the same way that the exodus of Moses took place, but it's going to be so much greater that we're going to look back on the one of Moses and be like, it's going to pale in comparison. Well, just do a study on the exodus of Moses. You're going to realize that was a really phenomenal, amazing, incredible thing. And like two million people, we always think, okay, they part of the Red Sea, great. And we watch it in a movie, and it takes like five minutes. No. go. And I think Ron Wyatt, I, some of his stuff I questioned, but I think he was right about the crossing. And if he was right about the crossing, where, where the, he believes that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, that's a sizable plot of water. Two million people with animals and children and old people among them. Now, just know what your normal pace is, and if you're carrying anything, now imagine trying to keep pace with old people and children and animals, two million going across that space. That wasn't just a five-minute cool thing with the water on the sides. That's like an all-night event, at least. I mean, it took some time. And you got this huge pillar of fire, you know, standing between the Israelites going through that thing to keep the Egyptians, you know, on the other side. It was an impressive deal. And Jeremiah's like, you ain't seen nothing yet. So I'm waiting for that. Not all the garbage that took place in World War II. And, you know, this is quite telling. They set up the statue of Nimrod at the Hebrew University. 1948, Nimrod was made king of the world. This is why I associate 48 with Nimrod and not Abram. Because everything about that place is honoring Nimrod. We shall rebel. I mean, they have, what, the largest gay population or something? I mean, they, you know, all the stuff that's going on over there is in rebellion as a nation. Again, I'm not talking about some of the individual people that, that are godly people. Okay, I want to be clear about that. But as a nation that has established itself, they set the Rothschilds up as a false messiah. The Rothschilds own that place. That's the shield of Rothschild. They set up a statue of Nimrod at the Hebrew University and built the Israeli Supreme Court with the all-seeing eye pyramid and all the... Masonic stuff that we have over here. Okay, that's, that's the telling part of the 1948 uh, connection in my mind. And Abram was called out of all of that mess when he was in Ur of the Chaldees, right? Um, and so Abram's born the same year Nimrod's made king of the world. Nimrod's evil kingship was a big part of the reason why Yahuwah called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees just south of Babylon in the first place. We re read in Genesis chapter 11 that uh, Terah takes his family and they leave Ur and, uh, and they, they stop in Haran. Why did they do that? Well, we know that, uh, that Terah, Abram's father, was an idol worshiper. 
In fact, if you read the book of Joshua, uh, it's actually a rather interesting story. One of the reasons why God called Abraham in the first place is because Abraham had actually spent some time when he was still Abram. He spent time with uh, Noah and Shem and learned about the one true God. Comes back home and his dad's, you know, the, he, he's like the chief idol maker for Nimrod's kingdom. And it, there's this courtyard full of gods. And he's like, okay, mom, can you cook some dinner up for the, I want to serve the gods. Okay, mom cooks up some dinner. He lays out some plates in front of the gods. Of course, they can't eat it. They're wooden stone, right? So he gets mad about it. He's like, this is stupid. My dad made these things. So he takes a hatchet and smashes all the gods, makes a big commotion out of it, and then puts the axe or the hatchet, whatever it was that he was using, in the hands of the largest god. And his dad, of course, heard the commotion, comes in there and sees all his gods all smashed. And he's like, what did you do? What are you doing? He's like, I didn't do it. He did. Look, he's got the axe right there. <laughs> And his dad's like, no, he can't do that. It's made out of wood and stone. And Abraham's like, yeah, hello, but fly. What the? Why are you worshiping it then? You know? So, you know, I could, I could just see God looking at Abraham going, I can work with this guy. You know? <laughs> you know? It's kind of a funny story, I mean, when you read it. And, uh, so, but they pack up their family, and they leave Ur the Chaldees, and they go to Haran. Well, why did they do that? Well, his dad was an idol worker. He was a maker of idols. And the chief god of Ur of the Chaldees was a god named Sin. So literally, Abram was called... Now, this is English, okay? I understand that we're talking about English here. I just find it interesting, as an English-speaking person, that the name of the god of Ur of the Chaldees was Sin, and Abram's called out of Sin. But he goes with his dad to Haran, which was the second capital of Sin. It was the patron god of both cities. So he just went from one capital of Sin to the next capital of Sin. Um, and, you know, I guess dad continued to do his thing. We know that Terah was an idol worshiper. We see that in Joshua 24.2, talking about that. Also in Joshua, uh, Joshua 24.2 and Joshua 9, 7, and 8 uh, tells us that those details. So in, we see in Genesis 12 where God says, okay, leave your father's house. Get out of there. You got to leave your family behind and, uh, and basically start walking, bro, and uh, I'll stop you when you get there. Now, one of the things that always bugs me is whenever I talk about Israel, the nation that we call Israel the way I was earlier, people are like, oh, Rob, you know, curse Israel. You're going to be cursed. You better not do that. Bless Israel, be blessed. Curse Israel, be cursed. And they'll quote Genesis 12, 1 through, I think, verse 3, I believe. Go back and read that. Okay? Basically, I'm going to paraphrase it, but... <laughs> God's saying, okay, I know I'm, I'm sending you out here to, do, to, to go leave your father's house. And, you know, you're going to go to a place. I'm not even telling you where to go. And just start walking. I'm, I, and he says, anyone who blesses you. So many times it says the word thee. And the word thee in the context is Abram. And, and he says, anyone that blesses thee, context Abram, I will bless. Anyone that curses thee, context Abram, I will curse. But everybody wants to jujitsu that and use it as a manipulative tool to get us to continue to support Zionism. Over there, I'm like, just go back and read Genesis 12, and you'll see the entire context is basically, hey, Abram, I know this is kind of scary. I know you don't really know me all that well. Just trust me. I got your back, bro. If anybody blesses you, I'm going to bless them. If anybody curses you, I'm going to curse them. Start walking. I mean, just read it. I'm, of course, paraphrasing it, but that's what it says. You know, so he does. He starts walking. Where does he go? This is uh, the general path that he took from Ur up to Haran. And then he leaves there, and he comes down into the, through the Levant there, comes down into the land we now call Israel. It was Canaan. And he, God stops him in Shechem. That's where he stops, Shechem. And so, well, why Shechem? What's the deal with Shechem? And as I had already done all this research on the, the trees and the garden and the, the rivers and all that, and then I see that God stops him in Shechem. So I started wondering, what's the deal with Shechem? And I had stumbled across this scripture right here in Hosea chapter 6, where there was this interesting connection there with Adam and Shechem. You know, kind of both being mentioned in the same chapter. I'm going, Adam breaking the covenant, and yet there's this thing going on with Shechem. So uh, long story short, and this, I get into a lot more detail and build up the story as to why I believe this. I'll just cut to the chase here. I believe Shechem is ground zero in the garden. I believe that's where the two trees were. One of the reasons why is, and I go through all the times that Shechem is mentioned and all the different things that, that took place there. Shechem is the first plot of land that was owned by the house of Abraham. They, they, bought, they purchased it, for, I think it was 100 pieces of silver or something. That's where Dinah was raped, and there was all kinds of stuff that took place in it right there. 
um, by Shechem, the guy for who the, tam- the town was named, from whom the, uh, he was named. Um, but what really caught my attention is when they came in from the Exodus, uh, and they're about ready to go into the land, if you get into Deuteronomy, he says, when you get into the land, I need you to go to Shechem and put half of the tribes of Israel on Mount Gerizim, put half of the tribe on Mount Ebal, pronounce the blessings on Gerizim and the curses on Ebal. Why? It is my firm belief that the tree of, the, of life was on Gerizim, or under it, maybe. Maybe it's buried, or was at that location at one time. And the curse on Ebal, because that's where I believe the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that that's the same place where uh, Yahuwah put Abram to sleep and cut the covenant and walk between, you know, where he put Abram to sleep and he walked through the covenant pieces himself. There's another passage in Psalms that says God's the one that divided Shechem. So could it be that that's where ground zero, where the covenant was broken in the garden, they were booted out. God says, okay, and they were booted out. If you remember last night, I said they were booted directly east. You end up in Babylon, and Ur is just south of that, that same area. I believe Abraham was called out of the place of exile because he found somebody that would be obedient to him, brought him back down there and stopped him in ground zero, and then cut a covenant with him, said, I'm going to make you a big nation. I'm going to bring your people through and all this stuff. Cuts a covenant, and I think he just did a big figure eight in the mountain right here. That was, this looks like one mountain range originally. And, and if, it, I've been there too. It, it's it, it's like it's a perfect amphitheater. How much, well, how much space would you say is between? That's the, pretty big. That's a city right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's you know I don't know exactly what the scale is, but that, I mean, but it's so. I mean, this is a, you know it's a city right here. Uh, but you imagine all of the the tribes of Israel split in half, the, and the blessing and the curses, and Joshua standing there in the middle, and everybody can hear each other. I mean, look at how big that place is. Yeah. It's a natural amphitheater. But they were told to go right back to this location. So the same place where the covenant was broken is the same place that God gave a covenant to Abram, and that's the place where Israel walked through the covenant, pronounced blessing in person. Again, it's speculation. I admit it. But circumstantial evidence seems to suggest pretty strongly that that's ground zero. That's why it's so. That's why it's such a significant place. Again, I go through that a lot more in the part two teaching uh, of the Yahuwah Triangle. Fascinating stuff. All that's online on YouTube, too, by the way. So, uh, again, I started this weekend talking about deception, disobedience, and exile. We learned that disobedience equals exile from the garden. Uh, and in Leviticus 18, it's this, again, this is God's land. This is Yahuwah's land. It's not the land of the Jews. It's not the land of Israel. If you disobey him, you're going to get vomited out. So I look at all the disobedience that's going on over there right now, and I'm thinking to myself, Bleh. They're going to get vomited. And what's that going to do to all of the teachers of eschatology who have all their eggs in that basket? When they see two-thirds of that place die in accordance with the scriptures, that's going to freak out a whole lot of evangelical Christians that are all about Israel. John Hagee and company, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But it's what it says is what's going to happen. I didn't write it. They did. Uh, the land's going to vomit you out. You got, if you're going to live on that plot of land and claim to be his people, then you've got to obey him. And the reason I think he's had his eye on that one sliver of land right there is because that's the place where he used to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden and fellowship with them. One on one. And he's been trying to get us back into that relationship again so we can do it all over again. That's why New Jerusalem comes back down and parks right there in the whole area. Uh, you know, we talked about this already when they, they got booted out, and this is the Yahuwah Triangle Diagram showing what I'm talking about, and, and again, this is, this is Shechem, and almost directly east is, uh, is Babylon. <clears throat> uh, that's where God walked with them to cool the day, and when they broke covenant with him, they booted, uh, uh, Yahuwah booted them out, sent them to Babylon, but the call the last days is to come out of Babylon. He wants to get us all back into that fellowship. Well, what is Babylon? What, what is, what's, why Babylon? What's, what's the deal with that? Well, the word Babylon uh, shows up about 265 times in a keyword search of the King James Bible, 273 times in the New American Standard Bible. Even just a cursory glance over the various references reveals that Babylon's not a good place to be. <laughs> you really don't want to be there. It is associated with captivity and evil. It is a place that was first founded by Nimrod. There he built a tower with the goal of reaching into heaven and trying to kill God. That's what his goal was. Uh, yeah, what's even more crazy about it is when you read that story, 
And it says that God looked down and saw what they're doing. And it says, now whatever they imagined to do would not be restrained from them. Which is, I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. That seems to say, I don't believe it's possible to kill God. But to reach into heaven and do what they were trying to do is at least theoretically possible. Because he said, you know, if, they, if I just let them continue. You know, so that's why he confounded their languages. Which is part of the reason why I question NASA. <laughs> that's a whole other talk. And, and the word NASA has some very interesting meaning in Hebrew to, to lift up. It depends on how you, uh, there's a little marker with the shin. And w one of them, uh, it means, to, I believe, to lift up. But the other, when the little dot is on the other side, it means to deceive. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. They're lifting up and they're deceiving everybody. So <laughs> yeah, I, got a, I got a blog on that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. That's pretty extraordinary. Uh, Babylon was the Greek name of the city written in the cuneiform script of the Babylonians, Babili, which means in Semitic, the gate of God. The Hebrews called the country as well as the city Babel. This name they considered came from the root Balal to confound, in Genesis 11.9. That's according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Thus Babylon is both the gate of God and the place of confounding, and so it has been throughout the scriptures. But Babylon is not so much the gate of Yahuwah, as it is rather the gateway of the gods, plural, the place from which all pagan gods originated in ancient Mesopotamia and Sumeria. That's where it, basically God says, you don't want to fellowship with me? You don't want me to be your husband? You don't want me to be your God? Fine. Go over there. Play with all the gods you want. You guys don't like the manna? Fine. Eat quail till you choke. You know, eventually God just gives us over to our reprobate mind. You know, he's like, I got a better way, but if you don't like my way, fine. Pfft, there you go. Which is why I think, you know, we've been given a, a number of, uh, we've been given some grace with this whole CERN activity. They keep trying to fire that thing up and then all kinds of crazy stuff makes, makes it, you know, not work quite right or whatever. You know, it was a, it was a beaver, or beaver or something, last weasel, whatever it was. <laughs> you know, and uh, before that it was like a bird dropping or I don't remember, something, but it's, you know, there's been these weird things that have happened that have caused it to not be able to do what they want to do. Uh, but I think eventually God's going to be like, okay, you're not getting a hint. Fine. That's what you really want. All right. You want to open that gate? Okay. Because eventually we know that Revelation 9 is going to happen. You know? And uh, I don't remember if it was Doug Hamp or somebody else was suggesting the idea that maybe the key is not necessarily a physical lock and key. It may be a code. It may be an equation. It, it may be the key to figuring out how to do it. You know, whatever the case may be, we know that something opens. And right now, CERN is the most likely candidate for that to happen. And it doesn't help that, that CERN is underneath a region that was originally known for Apollo worship and a city that, or a town that was called Apollyocum. It's all about Apollo. And outside the facility, they have Shiva, the, the Hindu god of destruction. Well, Abaddon is the name of the Hebrew god of this destruction. Apollo is the Greek name. Shiva is the Hindu name. So they got a Greek god or the Hebrew god of destruction in a portal dancing outside. The, Hello! In a facility that they even say that they're trying to, you know, rent time and space and you know, figure out the god particle and blah, blah, blah. Wow. So, you know, when I think of Babylon, I'm thinking God's just like, all right, is that what you want? Fine. Go. Uh, they're carried away to Babylon, received there in 2 Kings 20, 17. Um, Ezra 5, 12, you know, deported the people to Babylon. We know that the Jews spent 70 years there, right, in captivity because of their disobedience. Then finally they came out of Babylon, and I believe it is time for us to do the same. I talked about this last night. Why? Because, unfortunately, the Jews carried Babylon with them when they left. They brought back many pagan customs, beliefs, and practices from their time there, just as they did when they left Egypt. Those things, customs, ideas, and practices became intermingled with the true faith of Yahuwah, and it always got them into trouble. Those traditions brought forth from Babylon were the primary cause of many of the issues that Yeshua had to deal with when confronting the Pharisees and Sadducees of his day. I always wondered about the Pharisees and Sadducees, because they're all over the New Testament. But where are they in the Old Testament? There's nobody. You never see Pharisees and Sadducees in the Old Testament. Where do they come from? Well, they came from Babylon. Yeah, that whole thing, it's, it's all afterwards. And Yeshua was having to deal with that in his day. Of course, now the church of Yeshua has basically gone and done the same thing. 
Many of the traditions and practices of the Christian church today are rooted in pagan Babylon. We covered that last night. So what does it mean to come out of Babylon? What does it mean to redeem the bride? Wow, this was an interesting study, and it's going to dovetail uh, with Doug Hamp's earlier talk today. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. Ah, man, I feel sorry for that poor guy. <laughs> man, that's a rough deal. You know, God's like, yeah, tell me about it. You want to know what I've been through? Tell you what, dude. Go marry a prostitute. No, it's not a suggestion. I'm telling you, go marry a prostitute. Now, I'm going to let you know what I'm going through here. Yeah. yeah, Hosea continues. Yet the time will come when Israel's people will be like the sands of the seashore. Too many to count. That's what I think is the brilliant part of God's plan with the diaspora. Even though it was a punishment, it was a brilliant uh, move, strategy. Because he, this is the way I see the Tower of Babel. I believe Hebrew was the original language. I believe Hebrew was the language of God. And that at the Tower of Babel, there was, it was split into 70 languages. And so I kind of envision it like, okay, Satan, you know, God's kind of looking at him and saying, okay, you want to take me on? Fine. I'll give you 69. I'll take one. Give it your best shot. Let's go. So the devil takes over 69 nations, right? 69 people groups. God's got one, the Hebrews. He starts with Abram, one guy. You know, God, starts with, uh, God starts with Abram and, and the devil starts with Nimrod. And we see how Nimrod becomes known by many other names as a result of the Tower of Babel. And so he still, after the Tower of Babel, he was the king of the world. Do you think he just gave it up because the languages changed? No, he learned the languages and learned how to continue to rule over everybody else. Well, that's why there's so much symbolism. All the symbolism is the same everywhere. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. So he, you've got this powerful piece on the chessboard, Nimrod, that the devil's working with. He's got this little pawn over here, Abram. <laughs> That God leverages in such a way, even through all the disobedience and everything else, and where the northern tribes dis, uh, disobey, and he disperses them into the 69. Mm -hmm. Where they continue to do bad things, they continue to be corrupted, but the time comes, and we'll get to it later in this presentation, when Ephraim wakes up in the pig pen and says, what have I gotten myself into? But by this time, he's multiplied into a multitude of nations, mm -hmm. and he's spread all over the world, Waiting for the exodus that's going to make the one of Moses pale in comparison. That's going to be an extraordinary deal when God says, Okay, now that all my people have just popped up in the 69 all over the world, I'm bringing them in now. Oh, man, that's going to be cool. <laughs> then at the place where they were told, You are not my people, it will be said, You are children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and Israel will unite together. How many people do you see there? Two groups, right? That's the two house thing. That's where it all starts out right there. I'm in total agreement with Doug Hamp on this. They will choose one leader for themselves. They will return from exile together. Has that happened yet? No. Nah. What a day that will be, the day of Jezreel, when God will again plant his people in his land. Who's going to do it? Oh, so you mean it's not the Rothschilds, the, <laughs> the Zionists, the Freemasons, the United Nations? Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, if... Uh, if you haven't seen this teaching, I suggest you look it up. I think it's still online out there. I know that some of the videos of Jim Staley have been pulled down and stuff. But uh, th that teaching right there radically changed my life. I, when I watched it, I wept like a baby because it was like all this. I had this puzzle on the floor, and there were so many pieces missing. I just couldn't understand. And he just dumped them all on the floor, and most of them fell into place. Just when he dumped it on the floor with that, I'm like, wow! <laughs> ah, look at that. I mean, I, I still have the whole picture, but I got a lot of it. <laughs> that, and it's starting to make sense to me. And then I followed that up with this one right here, The Era of Dispensationalism by 119 Ministries. That is where a lot of things began, began to change for me because I was a hardcore preacher, rapture dispensation, dispensationalist, you know, fundamental, independent, Baptist, King James guy. You know, lots of things began to change after that. And I'm glad I watched it in this order, and I would suggest you do the same. This helps you figure out who you are, and then this helps you purge you know, a lot of the stuff that you were kind of messed up with from when you didn't know who you were. 
And then I would follow it up with this one right here. Yeah, 119, Steve Mutcher is nailed to the cross. Man, I had, uh, uh, <laughs> I was talking with somebody, uh, Alexander, when we were at uh, lunch, uh, he's got your foot in the boot there, and I, I had mine in a boot not a few years ago, and he asked me what happened to me, and I said, well, I, I was in a mad rush, I wanted to go see Star Trek when it came out, ran down the stairs, missed the last one, busted my foot in like three places. <laughs> had to have a plate, eight screws put in. And so as a result, I didn't see the movie and I was laid up in bed and, and on painkillers and stuff. Uh, uh, that Shabbat, that was, that was that weekend. So I couldn't go with my, the rest of my, you know, my wife and everybody to the home fellowship that we go to on Saturdays. And uh, so I was like, well, I'll just, you know, I'll find somebody else to watch in bed, you know, while I'm laying there. And I was surfing and I think it, it, it either just come out or it just was the first thing that popped up anyway. I watched that one and if I thought this one went off, you know, for me, that was like a nuclear bomb for me. That just, I, maybe it was the painkillers, but I, I was just, I could not stop crying. It was just, it was uncontrollable. It's so powerful. I just, you need to watch it. We don't have time to go into it so much, but the, I highly recommend these three videos right there. Uh, and again, all of this is, to illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. And we see as a result of that in Jeremiah chapter 3 that the northern kingdom was issued a divorce. You know? And I always wondered why the southern kingdom wasn't divorced too. But then I realized, well, there were promises that were made that God couldn't, he couldn't annul. <laughs> so he, even though Judah was just as bad, he's like, I, I've got to put up, if not worse, I've got to put up with Judah because I've got to bring my, my son through Judah. I've got to do all kinds of stuff that's got to happen through Judah. So, you know, I'm bound by my own word to keep that thing going, even though I'm not too happy with it. But the north, I have no obligation to do that. And I'm sick of your whoring around and divorce. Okay. Then you get to, when you start understanding identity crisis and what, what Jim Staley was teaching in that and stuff, and you start reading the scriptures, specifically the New Testament and the stories of, of Yeshua, the parables take on whole new meaning. All kinds of stuff starts popping out like you never saw before. And you realize that he's standing there in Judea talking to the Jews. He decided, I only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How many houses are there? Two. Two. He's in the house of Judah. And he says, I only come for the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's all that about? Then you start thinking, well, man, you know, if, as most of us were taught, the church didn't show up until 50 days after the resurrection at Pentecost, right? How many of you grew up with, the church was at Pentecost? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's true, it was at Pentecost, but not the one in Acts 2. It was at Pentecost on Mount Sinai. That's when the church showed up. That's when the church was married. That's when the church was created. That's why Stephen in Acts 7 says the church in the wilderness, the ecclesia, same word. Mm -hmm. So how does this make sense then? If that's your belief system, if you believe the church didn't show up until Acts chapter 2, how does it make sense where, where Paul says in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it when it hadn't even come into existence yet. When it didn't even show up until 50 days later. That doesn't make sense. And then you talk to your Christian brothers and sisters and say, oh, the feasts and all that stuff, that's just for the Jews. Oh, really? When did the church begin? It began on Pentecost. Hmm. A feast? Let that sink in for a minute. Yeah. Well, uh, Doug talked about the scripture a little bit in his. Deuteronomy 24 lays out a law that if a husband divorces his wife and she goes to be with another, and even if that person dies or whatever, the first husband can never take her back again because it's a violation of his own law. It's a, an abomination. He can't do it. And yet, when you look at the prophets... You see, it says that I've divorced Israel, you know, you're a whore and all that stuff, but I'm going to win her back again. The prophets keep talking about who is going to take back his divorced bride. See the problem? God created a law that said you can't do that. So when Paul says the mystery of the church, Paul's the guy that figured this out. If you understand what's going on in the book of Hosea, and you read Deuteronomy 24, Jeremiah chapter 3 with the divorce, Read the entire book of Hosea and then go read Romans chapter 7 through 11. You understand what Paul has figured out. It wasn't that the church was concealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. No, the church was there from Sinai. It's a church in the wilderness. Stephen knew that. He said it. Church was known. It's the assembly. The mystery is, how could God divorce and take her back? 
without violating his own law. That's the mystery. Paul figured it out. And you know that because he starts quoting pretty liberally from the book of Hosea. Uh, so you really have to read the book of Hosea to, under, to understand what's going on here. We have the bill of divorce right there in Jeremiah chapter 3. The only way the husband could take back the bride he had divorced without breaking his own law, Deuteronomy 24, would be to die for her. I believe this was the great mystery that Paul had figured out concerning the church. And one of the reasons why I say this is one of the scriptures that I would use is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the law. Which law? The whole thing or the law of the husband? Right? The law of the husband-wife deal? As long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. Hmm. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. <coughs> Who is he writing this to? Jesus. Romans. All right. So when you look at who the, who the apostles went to, especially if you read you know, some of the books like uh, Fox's Books of Martyrs and stuff like that, where you see where all the disciples went after Christ uh, had ascended, you know, and, you know, like Thomas, I think, died in India. You know, why did these, go, why did these guys go to the places they go to? They just kind of, you know, roll a dice and say, yeah, India, I think I'll go to India. No, they were, going, the, the, they were going to where they knew the lost tribes were. They weren't really lost. They were dispersed, but everybody knew where everybody was. But where's Paul always going to? He's going to the synagogue. He's going to the synagogue in Ephesus and Corinth, you know, in Thessalonica, and all these different places. Well, what's a synagogue doing in Gentile lands? You ever think about that? Because these are Israelites that are in the diaspora, and the disciples knew where they were. So Paul's writing to some of these guys in Romans, and he's saying, I'm speaking to those of you guys who know the law. Why would a Gentile pagan Greek have any understanding of the Torah? They wouldn't, but those in the diaspora would. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, as long as the guy is alive. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. Which law? The context is the law of the, the husband, bride situation. Not the whole Torah. Starts right at the beginning. I'm telling you guys who understand this. You become dead to that law, the law by the body of Christ, that you should be buried to another. To who? Even to him who is raised from the dead. The whole context is the husband has to die. Who are they free to remarry? The one who raised from the dead. <laughs> that's what it says. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now that's all King Jimmy. So uh, I think the Holman Christian Standard Bible kind of just renders that a little easier to understand. Chapter 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brothers, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the crucified body of the Messiah, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear fruit for God. You guys starting to get it? That's the greatest love story ever told. That's extraordinary. Hosea, Hosea 2. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal, Baal, from your lips, and you will never mention them again. Oh, by the way, Baal is a word that has a meaning, and the meaning of the word Baal is Lord. <laughs> now, Adonai also means Lord. The problem is, Everywhere you see capital L-O-R-D, it's not there to, uh, to represent the Hebrew word Adonai. It's replacing the word yod heh vav -Heh, Yahuwah. Okay, the Lord. There is a name that means the Lord, and it's not Yahuwah. It's Baal. He says, I'm going to wipe the names of Baal, or Baal, from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground. So they, will know, so they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land. Has that happened yet? No. All right. All swords and bows, so you can live unafraid in peace and safety. Has that happened yet? No. 
I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me, not as the Lord. He just said he's going to remove that. (laughs) You'll finally know me as Yahuwah. This is one of those scriptures that, like many others, it drives me crazy. (laughs) I am the the Lord. The Lord is my name. No! No! I am Yahuwah. Yahuwah is my name. Yeah, in vain means to basically bring to nothing, to nullify, to replace it with a title, which is what we've all done. So he says, I'm going to remove the names of Baal, that means Lord, and you will finally call me the Lord, right? (laughs) Right. No. Uh, One of the reasons I, I believe Baal is a representation of Nimrod is because when you look at various depictions of some of the ancient gods of the, of the ancient world, uh, there's a lot of very close similarities. You have Baal right here in the same pose as Orion. Orion's a mighty hunter. What was Nimrod called in the Bible? Mighty right? Gilgamesh, you know, with the lion, the, the Nerta. You also see a lot of depictions of him usually associated with the lion, who's also referred to as lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? So you've got these two opposing characters, Christ and Antichrist. Right? You're going to finally forget the Baals of the world, the Nimrod, all that stuff, and finally recognize Yahuwah. Um, Hosea 2, 22 through 23. Then the Lord will answer the thirsty cries of the grain, the grapevines, and the olive trees, and they in turn will answer Jezreel. God plants. That's what Jezreel means. At that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites. Who's going to do it? He says, I. He's going to do it. And raise them for who? Himself. I will show love to those I called not loved, and to those I called not my people, I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. How do I know that Paul understood this? Because that's what he's quoting in Romans chapter 11. In Romans 11, he's talking about, for I know, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery? The whole divorce and remarriage thing. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to who? Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Well, the fullness of the Gentiles, all you have to go to figure that out is go to, I think it's, uh, was it Genesis 48, where Jacob crosses his arms over Ephraim and Manasseh, and where he, where he says, yeah, I know my son, I know, you know, which one's the oldest and all that stuff, and he prophesies, you know, gives a prophecy for Manasseh, but he says, you know, the, the younger is going to be greater and all this stuff, and prophesies over Ephraim that he would become the multitude of nations. The fullness of the Gentiles. That's what's going on right there. Until the fullness of the Gentiles, Israel, the northern tribes, will come back in. So then all Israel shall be saved. As as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. I saw this graphic Mm -hmm. online, kind of modified it a little bit to clarify it. Hold that. I want to keep going or I'll get behind. Um, This right here is the perfect illustration to, illustrate, to show us who we are. You know, there is, you know, if you want to say the Hebrew roots, there's a tree that is Israel. But if blood-born Israelites reject Yeshua, what happens to their branch? Broke off, thrown away. Then over here, you got pagan root Gentiles. We believe in Yeshua. What happens to our branch? We get grafted in. It's not rocket science. You know, if believing Israel, if, if uh, uh, Israelites decide to believe in him, what do you think happens to their branch? Back in. He's, and Paul talks about that. He's like, you know, if he's able to take the natural branches and, you know, and put you in, don't, don't get too excited. You know, because if he's able to do that with them, don't you think he could do the same thing to you? This is like, this is it. This, is, this, this describes the church, who the church is, what the church is. The cultivated olive tree. And there's two sticks I wrote a, a, a blog a while back called Pick a Stick because there's only two. <laughs> there's not a little third twig over here called the church somewhere. <laughs> there's a stick of Judah and a stick of Ephraim. All right? It, once you understand that, you realize God has one people, one bride, and one plan. I used to be one of those guys that thought that there was two brides. That Yahuwah had a bride, that's Israel, and that Yeshua has a bride, and that's the church. And like we talked about, and I think Doug mentioned it too, the belief, and it's when you break it down, this is what the preacher of rapture belief is. Yeshua, it's this good cop, bad cop scenario, right? 
you know, there's the wife beater and there's the guy who loves everybody. And Yeshua's going to take his bride and it's all going to be great. And they're going to have a party for seven years. And meanwhile, Yahuwah is going to come down and beat the snot off his wife for seven years until she loves him again. You know, that's kind of crude, but that's what we believe if you break it down. When, when I was in that paradigm, that's exactly what we believed. You know, we'd never word it that way, but it drives the point home. Uh, <laughs> And actually, John Nelson Darby, who I believe is the originator of dispensation theology, actually understood this. He had, a, he had a, his own translation. You want to talk about a cult leader? Oh, man. This guy has every definition there is of a cult leader. And to the point where he's like, okay, I'm going to create my own translation of the Bible, <laughs> the Darby translation, so I can get every, all my theories into it that I want. Um, but when he translated Genesis chapter 48, he actually translated and understood that the prophecy over Ephraim was the multitude of nations. The fullness of the Gentiles, Gentiles, another way of putting it. He understood that. But what's bizarre is when you start talking the way we've been talking here this weekend, many people who are in the dispensation camp will look at, at us and say, that's replacement theology. And I'm like, uh, no, if you believe this, that's replacement theology. If you believe for thousands of years it was Israel, 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 cross, boom, church. That's replacement you replace this with that. How can you not see that? That's what, I don't get it, man. But, you know, I, I'm laughing at myself because I was in that camp. The, the me of 10 years ago would have fought with the me of today until both of us passed out of, out of exhaustion and neither one of us would have convinced the other of anything. <laughs> it's just a fact. You know? So, <laughs> man... Yeah, anyway, so this, this is, uh, I already talked about this, the multitude of generations. I'm sorry, Again, I, uh, Paul understood Hosea, where it talks about, you know, the people who say, you're not my people, I will now say you are my people. In Romans chapter 9, he talks about, and we among th those whom we, he selected, both from the Jews and the Gentiles, concerning the Gentiles now, he says, you know, parenthetically, it's like, you know, okay, now concerning the Gentiles, God says in the book of Hosea, so he knows, we know where he's going with this, those who are not a people, I will now call my people, and I will love those whom I did not love before. That's how we know he's not just talking about Joe Blow, Pagan Greek. We know when he's talking about concerning the Gentiles, he says, he's quoting Hosea, and then he says what Hosea said. So we know specifically who he's talking about right there. Paul understood this totally. And that's what gets me so frustrated about the Hebrew Roots movement and people in it that want to throw Paul out. I'm like, are you kidding me? Paul gets it. And Paul passes the Deuteronomy 13 test mm -hmm. yes, with flying colors. But you only realize that if you know and understand what he read before you read what he wrote. True. And now I've begun to say, you know, I, look, I've been in the Bible since I was able to read it my whole life. Yeah. All right, I can say with absolute confidence that you should never read one sentence Paul wrote until you understand what Paul read. Because until you understand what he read, you'll never understand what he wrote. And you're going to twist and manipulate everything that Paul wrote and, and do what Peter said, warned against. Ignorant, unstable people twist and distort what he wrote and fall into the error of lawlessness. And that's exactly what's happening in the Christian church. And I was one of those people who would have taught the same thing. In fact, I did teach a whole lecture. I said, okay, you want to go back under the law? Fine, pick up sticks on Saturday and see how that works for you. <laughs> Quoting Numbers chapter 15. That was so stupid. <laughs> but I was just as passionate and dogmatic then as I am right now. <laughs> Which scares me because I could be saying this guy is so stupid 10 years from now. So, you know, whatever. But that's why I said at the beginning of this, don't believe a thing I say. I'm up here teaching, but I'm not your teacher. I'm just a loudmouth student up here, you know, blabbing out things that I think I know. That's what we are. <laughs> I'm serious, man. This, this passage right here, oh, wow. Hosea chapter 3. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again. Remember, he was told to go marry a prostitute. He's out sleeping around with other people. This, the reason why this hits me so hard is because my first marriage ended in divorce as a result of, I came, I came back from a six day business trip to an empty house, letter of divorce, my wife for seven years is out sleeping with some other guy in Maine. 
And it, it just ripped my world apart. I mean, we were active together in church, taught Sunday school together. I wrote, directed, and played Jesus and Passion Plays, and she played Mary. You know, yeah, the whole deal. And, uh, wow, this just ripped me up. And for, for some time shortly after all that happened, God kept putting homeless people in my path. And, it, and I really believe you reap in like kind to which you sow. You plant an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree, right? You reap, what you, you, you reap what you sow. I didn't realize it at the time that when he was putting these homeless people in my path to help, it was because I was about to become homeless. And I think he was testing me. You know, I look back at it in hindsight and say, I wonder what would happen if I didn't help all those homeless people. Because when I was homeless, a lot of people did help me. But I have to believe it's because I actually helped a lot of homeless people, or at least several anyway, before that happened to me. So uh, I was working for this guy. He had me running some errands. I had to go mail some packages. I had his van. And I see this homeless guy there. And, and I, I w- at that season, I mean, it was a rough time. That was the icing on a very bad cake, the, the divorce and everything. I was bankrupt and you know, lost a lot of money. I was within, literally within a signature of a $70 million contract before I lost everything and literally lost everything. And uh, then I, when I finally crawled back out of that hole and made a little bit of money and I had just cashed a check, I had the money in my pocket. I'm driving to the post office. There's a homeless guy. God says, give him all your money. I'm going, what? <laughs> am, I hearing, am I hearing something? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I really felt compelled that that's what I had to do. So I said, okay, Lord. And I, I, you know, I, I do these little deals with God sometimes. I'm like, okay, here's the deal. <laughs> I said, I said yeah, he just laughs at me, but that's the way it is, you know, uh, the way I think anyway. I, I said, you know, I don't want to just enable somebody that's going to use this money that I need, <laughs> quite a bit of it, to go get drunk or use it on drugs or whatever. I said, if he's a, a legitimate, has a legitimate need, I mean, if this is a person who really has a need, let me just go in there and mail the packages and let him still be there. If he's just a vagrant and he's going to cause a problem, go get drunk or you get high or whatever, just have him walk off. You know? and so I went in there and did my thing, and I came out, and he's standing in the same spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I got the van because it's a really hot day, and there's air conditioning in the van. You know? So I called the guy over. Come over here. You know, come sit in the van. So he kind of reluctantly didn't know what to do about that, you know, but he came over and he sat in the van. I said, hey, man, I, I, you know, I want to help you out, but first I want to hear your story. What's, what's the deal? Why are you in this situation? And as he's telling me his story, it was my story. He was telling me my story. And so I start crying as he's telling his story. He's like, what's the matter? I said, you're where I'm about to be, bro. <laughs> and he turns to me and says, you need to read the book of Hosea. I'm like, that's, that's like Habakkuk, or, you know? It's like, who reads that when you're a New Testament Bible-believing Christian, you know? I'm like, Hosea. And then this guy goes to preaching to me for like a half hour. I'm just sitting there, you know, what? And so after it's over, I'm just like, here you go, dude, you know? Hand on the money. We, we prayed together. He goes, let me pray for you. I said, he prays for me. And then, um, then he leaves, he gets out, and I'm just like just blown away by the whole encounter. And so I just said a quick, quick prayer. I'm like, Lord, <laughs> he was more for me than I was for him. Thank you. And that's all about all he said. And then I look, and he, I can't find him. I'm looking in the rearview mirror. I'm looking at He's gone. So I'm thinking, is this one of those angels unaware of things, you know? And it turns out it wasn't. He called me sometime later um, and told me where that seed had, what happened with that seed. It got him what he needed to do to get back on his feet. Uh, and later he had opened up a homeless ministry to help people wow. in need. And he had contacted me to tell me what ooh, that's hurting me right now <laughs> um yeah he uh just told me what that had done but i couldn't receive this message in that season i read the book of Isaiah. yeah that's right she's a whore you know i get it <laughs> okay yeah i get it stinking whore yeah that's about all I got out of it. So, you know, now we're, you know, we're, so we're talking like 2002, okay? You flash forward to about 2014 when, when I was really impressed to do this in-depth study that became the Uhua Triangle series. 
And I got to, and I'm just, I was impressed to really read the book of Hosea. And I had actually forgotten about that encounter. It was during, I'm reading through Hosea, and I get to this chapter right here, and I just snapped in half. And just was like, whoa, oh, man, God, you're awesome. Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that Yahuwah still loves Israel. Even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relationships with anyone, not even with me. This shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or prince and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterward, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of Yahuwah and his goodness. I don't know about you guys, but I'm there. I am trembling in awe of Yahuwah and his goodness. And, and through, the own, the, through the actual practical experience that I went through in my life, I have some small understanding of what ha- was going on here. And then a number of years later, Yahuwah restored and brought me my bride. I said, my picker is broken. I'm not picking the next one. <laughs> you, you, you're going to have to pick the next one because I can't pick right. So... Uh, he did. He, he, he brought me into a full-time ministry. I became a missionary in January of 2004, and a few months later, uh, interesting, August, a new beginning, eight, eighth month, August. <laughs> so that's cool, God. In the eighth month, there, 2004, uh, he brought the woman that would become my bride-to-be into my life, and she had a, a 13-year-old son when we got married. And so I adopted him. And he was not a Garcia. Now he, or he was not a Skiba. Now he is a Skiba. I get it. Right? I was not a people. Now I am a people. My son didn't change his DNA. He has Garcia DNA going through his blood. But I have given him a new identity. He wears my name on his baseball jersey. He is heir to anything I have to leave for him and anything my family has to offer is his. He is free to participate in every tradition my family has ever started if he so chooses. He can go the route of following his biological father if he wants. But I have given him a new identity that he can choose to accept. I believe that's exactly what's happened with us. And I thank God for the things because I always said I didn't want kids. I love kids. I actually really love kids, but I know the style of life that I have always had. I'm always on the go. I'm always traveling. And my dad was a nine-to-fiver. My dad was always there for me. And I I always said if I was going to be a dad, I wanted to be the kind of father my father was. But I knew that the type of lifestyle that I have and the the ministry that I'm called to, I couldn't be that. But I end up marrying a woman who has a 13-year-old son, so I I didn't have to do all that diapers and all the, you know, uh, you know. I am now more on the coach side of things and can be the friend side of things and can be that for my son. But, you know, he's 22 now, so he's off and doing his own thing, so I'm still free to travel. So God worked it all out and then taught me a pretty powerful lesson as, as to who I am in him through this, scenario, through this whole situation right here. Um, I, how much time do I have left, John? Uh, about 10 minutes. You can wrap it up. Okay, let me see if I can... Yeah, I'm not going to, there's a lot more to this, uh, just dealing with obedience, you know, and how it's really a matter of love, but you guys understand that. Um, I want to just I'll cut to right here. What's the deal with the Hebrew Roots Movement? Those of us who are returning to Torah and doing Shabbat and doing the feast and stuff like that are being associated with this thing they call the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, I distance myself from that title only because there are certain things within the official movement that I absolutely disagree with. Like some of the people wanting to tear Paul out of the New Testament, some of them dissing Yeshua as the Messiah, some of them wanting to get back into polygamy because all the patriarchs had multiple wives. Just, 
lots of weird craziness going on, and I hate labels because labels come with the baggage that are so, is associated with the labels. So I created a label for myself. I'm, I'm, don't, I'm not in that label. First, I thought uh, the, the label that I would go with is I'm in the whole Bible movement. It just means I, I, I tore out the commercial interruptions that were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, the one that says Old Testament and New Testament, just <coughs> tore those pages out. So it goes right from the contents to the maps and everything in between. So I thought, okay, that's, I'm in the whole Bible movement. But then when I started to understand this, I realized this is Ephraim waking up in the pig pen. And it's the snapshot in my mind as a filmmaker, you know, it's the moment where he woke up, he smells the crap all around him, looks at the mess that he's in, looks at the pigs and says to himself, how did I get myself into this mess? I wonder if dad will take me back. The moment that he has that thought is the picture in my mind. It's a snapshot, Polaroid, right? I call it the Ephraim Awakening. So that's the title that I adopted for myself. I said, I'm not in this Hebrew. I'm part of the Ephraim Awakening. But whatever you want to call this, it is undeniable that there is an awakening taking place where people all over the world, and it's not a cult because a cult has a leader that stands up with some idea and people start following that person. These are individual people popping up all over the world, waking up one day in the pig pen going, how did I get here? Nothing that guy is saying in the pulpit makes any sense to me because he's saying this and the Bible says this and that's wrong. I don't get it, but I'm out of here. And, and most of the people that I have met that have come into this journey went through a dry season because they left their church for whatever reason. They went church hopping and everywhere was another brand of milkshake, garbage, and then, you know, we did church on the pillow for a while and tuned in the radio and listened to somebody if we found somebody. And then one day we just said, you know, my friend invited me one day. It was Black Friday, actually, 2009. I hate Black Friday because uh, it's like, you know, we have Thanksgiving. Everybody's so thankful, right? And the next day everybody kills each other for, like, tickle me, Elmo, you know, or something, you know. So, but it's a, to be fair, it's a good, you can get some good deals. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a filmmaker and I needed to get some computer equipment. So, you know, not being a hypocrite here, I'm telling you. Hey. So I'm like, but I, it's just, I hate the rat race of it all, you know, especially since a lot of those sales are for Christmas. But at any rate, I, I went to go get some computer equipment and this heaviness sat on top of me as I'm in the parking lot of Fry's Electronics. And I'm like... Well, it already come out, but I'm, <laughs> I, but but I'm sitting there, I I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, yeah, Black Friday. I'm, I I didn't like Black Friday, but that wasn't it. It was something different. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it, it wasn't that. And I said, you know, Lord, what is this? And I just felt like I needed to call somebody to pray with me. So I went through my contact list, my phone, and literally, you know, I got to my friend Kevin. God just stopped my finger and I said, call him. So I said, okay, you know. I didn't know him all that well. I mean, he was a friend of mine, but I just knew him from the church, that, the, the Christian church that we both went to. Um, so I called him, and uh, yeah, he prayed with me. And then he says to me, he says, hey, uh, my wife and I are going to a Torah study at the Christian bookstore tomorrow morning. You want to go? I'm going, Torah study at the Christian bookstore? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, this is Black Friday, so it was Shabbat. You know, so I said, okay. So we go there, and it was the Torah portion where um, Joseph is sold into slavery. And the facilitator of that meeting said, um, I want you to draw a line on the center of your page and write uh, Joseph uh, on one side and Yeshua on the other. And write down how many parallels can you see in the life of Joseph and the life of Yeshua. Now, I was aware of the types and shadows. I understood that. But I never consciously sat down to think about that in a day, day of my life. Just off the top of my head, I came up with 25 parallels between the life of Joseph and Yeshua. And I'm going, wow. And then when everybody shared together, we had at least double that. And I'm going, wow, this is, this is amazing. Well, that's the same Torah portion where, where you know, Judah and, and, the, and Tamar and the whole situation right there. And the question came up, was Tamar Canaanite? I'm going, no, no way she was Canaanite because of all my Nephilim research. Well, people are like, well, yeah, she is. She's got to be a Canaanite. I'm like, no way. There's no way. Can if Tamar is a Canaanite, we got big problems with Yeshua. You know, so we got into a big discussion. And I went home, and I'm digging, digging deep, trying to figure out Tamar can't be a Canaanite. And so... I'm going through all this stuff, and I found in the book of Joshua that she's of the house of Shem. I'm like, oh, yeah. So I couldn't wait to get back to class, but I was chomping on steak for the first time in a long time. And, and those, those Torah study meetings 
you know, a typical church is 45 minutes to an hour, right? And you're watching your clock so you can go eat your ham dinner, your lunch, whatever. <laughs> so, but our Torah studies that we were doing were going for hours, and I couldn't get enough of it. Hours. And we would start at like 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and it wouldn't be uncommon for us to go home at 1 or 2 in the morning. Now I understand why the dude fell out of the window. <laughs> Because I used to think they're meeting on Sunday and it's a, he caught a sunbeam after lunch and he got tired and, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and fell out. No! Dude fell out 2 o'clock in the morning probably. You know? They're like, nope, not on my watch. Get up, you know. So, so I go there and that was the beginning of my journey, 2009. As I have begun to speak about this publicly and I've been all over the world, you know, all the way to Cape Town, South Africa, Canada, all over the United States, I've, I've talked to congregations and, and audiences of varying sizes, and I've asked how many people came into this understanding of Torah and started to try to walk in it somewhere in the 2009 to 2010 time frame. And more often than not, I would say almost probably 8 out of 10 times, that was the date that most people. And I'm going, there's no personality that ever rose up on TV or ever started talking about that I'm aware of. No radio personality, no internet preacher. I'm like, what happened? I became obsessed. What's the deal with 2009? Why did this happen? And it was in the course of doing this study. I'm like, okay, Judah went into captivity and served 70 years, one year for each of the Sabbath years that they didn't give the land rest, right? They learned their lesson and got to go back, right? The problem is there's no evidence that Ephraim ever repented. Ephraim's sentence was 390 years, according to Ezekiel chapter 4. So their initial judgment, the Jews had 70, they repented, came back after 70. Northern Kingdom got 390, was dispersed, but no, there's no indication they ever repented. And, you know, that's, uh, you get that in Ezekiel 4, he's told to lay on his side and all that stuff. Well, Leviticus 26 says, if you don't learn your lesson when I chastise you, you get seven times the judgment. Well, seven times 390 gives you 2,730 years from the time of their judgment. Their judgment was in about 721 B.C. Well, if you go forward 2,730 years from 721 B.C., guess what year you end up in? 2009. That's the end of Ephraim's judgment. That's why we're all waking up in the pig pen. We could not, I mean, there were some forerunners. There were, you know, the Rico Cortez and some of these other guys, other guys before him that have been around in some cases for decades. But there were lone voices crying in the wilderness. You know, that everybody thought was crazy and always paying attention. Now, these guys are the mentors for a lot of us that are younger coming up. So God had to raise them up first so some of us could get a clue what we're doing. But I, I'll tell you what, when I first came into this in 2009, and, you know, I, I started watching some of these guys, and I started watching, like, Zach Bauer and 119 Ministries and stuff. And then as I started getting invited myself to speak at some of the same events that these guys were at and started talking with them, I found out they came into it at the same time I did. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, I thought these guys were, like, you know, big gurus or something. They were toddlers just out of the womb, you know. And, and I found myself on the speaking circuit when I'm, like, one years old in this, too. This, there's an acceleration. I'm not saying any of this to brag or anything like that, but God is accelerating to everybody who's starting to understand this. When they start to meet with intention on the Shabbat, on the date night that God set aside and says, hey, let's get together. You know, on his schedule, he says, hey, this is date, date time. When you get to, yeah, I love that you worship me on Sunday. That's great. But, you know, I had a date set up yesterday. You know, I mean, I wish you would have been there with me. I mean, it's great. I, I think you can worship every day of the week. I have no problem with that. Just don't replace it with Sabbath. You know, say it's, the replacement for Sabbath. When you meet on his appointed times, I think there's a, an added anointing. There's a download, if you will. And people are seeing things that they've never seen before. Been in the scriptures my whole life. The first year, I learned more in the first year of home study group like that than in all the 40 years prior. In that first year. That's what's going on, I believe, with the Hebrew roots movement, Ephraim awakening, whole, whatever you want to call it. Is it ended right there? It's probably a good place for me to end because I could ramble on forever. Um, there's a lot more, obviously, to, to all this, but I'm excited, you know, if you can't tell. <laughs> you know, a big part of decoding deception is, you know, the, the hard part about deception is when you're in it, you don't know that you are. So it's praying a lot. Father, if I am deceived about anything, show me the truth. It's as simple as that. 
And, and then the, the, the hard decisions need to be made. You know, do I need to stay in this church? Do I need to do this or do that? Whatever. You know what? As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Yahuwah. Right? So that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.